a playlist original. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of Back to the Bottle Podcast. My name is Gaius Bowling, and I am joined with my two favorite people to chat with on a Monday night. <laughs> Let's go. Good to be back wow. again. <laughs> um, so usually uh, we would talk about the things that we uh, watched over the weekend, but there's a lot to cover today. So we're kind of just going to go right into uh, some news. Um, this first bit of news, it's funny because we were talking about this before we started our podcast. So like if we're going to discuss uh, what happened on the Rust movie set, um, mm-hmm. shooting and everything. And you know, I, I personally didn't want to talk about it like early on because there's like so many facts that are still kind of coming out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I just, I just want to start before we get into it, just by saying that it's an ongoing investigation right. and we don't have all the details yet. So mm-hmm. everything is very like allegedly, we just need to make sure that we're not making any assumptions mm-hmm. quite yet. It's all conjecture. Yeah. Um, and I agree with that too, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of different people involved you know uh you know of course tragically you know elena hutchins lost her life on that movie set uh the director joel Susan got was injured during the shooting uh, so there are a lot of you know she has a husband and a kid there's a lot of uh people involved in this and you know we're just going to try to be careful to kind of talk about it delicately but it was kind of mm-hmm. hard not to talk about it uh because alec baldwin who was the actor and producer on the film russ decided he wanted to talk about it mm-hmm. uh, an AB, on an ABC News interview, um, I'm gonna just start by saying this. I kind of think he did this advice of like his lawyer. Like I can't imagine any lawyer would be like, "Yeah, go and take a stance on this either way." Like, yeah. like most, I think most lawyers would be like, "Hey, you need to just keep quiet," because like, like he even says in the interview, like the investigation can go until like February, March. So it'll, you know, I think that he kind of wants to get ahead of it and kind of. Because of things that people are uh, things that are, are being said about him in regards to this, and I think mm-hmm. that's why he wants to get ahead of it. Um, the response has been kind of polarizing. It hasn't been like entirely positive. Um, I'll get my take on it real quick, and then I'll see what you guys thought. I I kind of err on the side of uh, I understand. I it's not his fault. Like it's it's an accident. It was an accident. Um, there's a lot of like blame being put pushed in his direction because he was a producer on the project. Mm-hmm. To him in the interview he wasn't the producer that like you know was in charge of like the hiring and all that stuff he you know he he's the biggest name on it and this was about more about him putting up the money to do the movie so he if there was some blame there i, like, I think that's where most people were going to go like you're a producer like you were you should have been on top of everything that was going on etc but there were certain things in the interview that kind of bugged me and it was more the the reaction time that he kind of had after the shooting happened yeah talked about how like first of all he says he didn't pull the trigger so he like um uh, and actually the ad first ad also backed that up said that he didn't pull the trigger it went off um but he said after it goes off she goes down and no one really knows how to react and he's talked about how like he maybe sit over her for like what 60 seconds maybe that seems like a, mm-hmm. a lot of time to know like what happened. And then he also said that the director yelled out in like immense pain when he got hit. Yeah. And he still said he didn't know the gravity of what happened until later. Um, maybe it could have been shock. I don't know. I just thought that that part of it was kind of strange. Like I would, mm-hmm. I would think like if, if I, I don't know how much uh, the stress she was in, like, it didn't look like she was hurt that bad or what it was, but like it just seems like weird to me that like the reaction time on on his part, like the way he described it, just seemed odd. Yeah, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way about that, but that's that was a big takeaway I took from it. Where the event itself seems the way he described it just seems very off, and that's just my opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the fact that he did wait, I mean, he was holding the weapon when it happened, um, and so him not really being sure what happened uh, and that response time. I think that that is a little uncertain for myself. I mean, I, I kind of read into that as he's trying to say basically anything he can to move the blame to anything else, 
rather than himself. Um, I think that I totally agree this was an accident. It was not necessarily his fault, but people have gone to jail and done other things for much similar situations. Um, and I think that he being the backer of this project and him having a lot of creative or a lot of control in what's going on um, and also being the person that was directly involved, I think that there should definitely be some blame to be put on him. Uh, and regardless of uh, what he says and what actually happened, I think that it'll be a while before we actually know exactly what happened until it comes out for public record. Um, but I think that there's no way that he's going to come out unscathed from this. Uh, and before you jump in, Brittany, I just want to point out too that the DA after the interview aired, because you know he kind of said like there there's someone to blame here, but it's not me. Um, it's like whoever put a live round in the gun, that's who is to blame. But the DA said that no one is off the hook in this, including him. Uh, that you know if they yeah. thought that like you know there's certain things that he maybe he should have done as a producer like on this project, like I, I that's the kind of I mean she just says that everything is kind of on the table. No one's off the hook. Like everyone that works on that movie is being looked at, you know. So for him to say like, "Oh, this is not my fault. It's not my fault. I don't have any blame here." Like they obviously feel differently. Like they like if we look into this and we do you think you're culpable in some way that they will take further action on that. And I just I just wanted to make a couple of points really quick about just the logistics of a film set that I think is important to note um, before we start placing bets on who uh, whose fault it is. Um, first of all, H Helena Hutchins is a mother and a, and a wife first and foremost. And I think mm -hmm. that we need to remember that, that this is a living or was a living person that is now a child, no longer has a mom and no, no spouse. So that's really important to note. Um, there's an armor on set who it was her second film ever working as an armor and I think that's really important to note that she was on a podcast right before this incident happened where she was saying that she didn't even think she was ready for this mm -hmm. and then this was her second film um and then th there's two positions that that she was actually hired for she was hired for armor and armorer and she was hired for the assistant prop manager and on a low budget film they talked about this in the, in the interview, a low budget film, people get stretched out and they start doing more roles than just that one that they're hired for. I've been on a low budget film set where I've done that before. Uh, you, you start becoming all these jobs and then it gets all you know convoluted mm -hmm. where it all blends together and you're not really sure what your job is anymore <laughs> or yeah. what you're getting paid to do. And um and that's where things start to fall through the cracks. And I think that's really important to note as well. Um, and he, I forgot, who was the guy interviewing Alec Baldwin? Uh, uh, George Yeah. So he, he I, I wrote this quote down because I, I thought it was a really good quote. He asked, he asked Alec Baldwin, were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? And I think that's a really good question that like the lawyers need to be asking because yeah. when you start cutting budget, that's when bad things start happening. And there was already an incident previously on this set involving a gun. So they already mm. knew that there were issues with protection and safety and the, this, this was allowed to happen. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about the gun is so you have a hot gun versus a cold gun and there is no such thing as a prop gun so i think there's a lot of misinformation about sets and um the types of guns being used on sets um so it's either a, a hot gun or a cold gun there is no such thing there's dummy rounds but there is no such thing as a fake gun on set they're all real guns that's so that's that's really the only like logistics i wanted to touch on right and that's gotcha. important though too. I think a lot of people think that like a prop gun is like some kind of like toy gun you would get in the store or something like that. And in the reality, yeah, they are using like yeah, they're all real. Whether they have rounds in them or whether right. if they have fake rounds in them, those are all completely different things. Alec Baldwin thought he was getting a cold gun, which means he was getting a real gun. He thought it was empty. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's and why she's the daughter of she's the daughter of a very famous 
armor. So what I noted is that uh, I like one of the, the most famous. So I think that there was a lot of pressure put on her to kind of take the reins of what her father had done. Um, and maybe they thought that she was more prepared just because she had kind of grown up in the business. But to put all that pressure on her can be tough. Um, but maybe she wasn't ready for it. Yeah, I kind of I'm kind of on the fence on how they have reported stuff about her because I think it's unfair for the media. I mean, I know like she's an armor, so like they're gonna like you're gonna go to her, right? She should have known what was going on with the gun. And then the first AD, they're like, well, he's the second person that should have known what was going on. But a lot of the, the things that are being written about her before we even know exactly what happened is there's a lot of vilifying her uh, before we really know what kind of occurred. And I know like a lot of people have used like the podcast thing uh, as an like, example. And I kind of agree with that. I don't think she was, maybe she wasn't ready. I think maybe a part of the reason she got some of the job might have been some nepotism because of who her father is. Um, but I also think it's unfair to kind of vilify her now be, before we know everything that you know it just you know and like her lawyers are taking a very different approach to it they're mm -hmm. suggesting that there was sabotage because you know some people walked off the movie before this happened um alec Baldwin brings this up in the, in the interview where they he says that they basically just told him they wanted better accommodations for like their crew and stuff like that, like hotels, blah, blah, blah. I, we, I still don't 100% know what's true and what's true about that. He claims that like they never came to him about uh, anything that they, they fell in safe while working on the movie. Yeah. Uh, but that is kind of the narrative they went with. Like, you know, they said that it just wasn't the, the working conditions weren't good. And whether that means we weren't given better hotels or things on set weren't running right, we don't know that yet. Um, I think that's the, the big thing here is like a lot of it is still kind of unknown. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I agree with Brittany, like, you know, she was this uh, up and coming cinematographer. She had a lot of potential. Everyone that has talked about her talked about just how great person she was and how sweet she was, how dedicated she was to work, uh, to her work. And, you know, she went to work that day, not expecting anything like that to happen. That's what's kind of yeah. the crazy <clears throat> thing about it. Like she went to work doing what she loved. And I kind of, I don't want to put yeah. words in them out. I mean, like, I would assume that even if those conditions on that set weren't the best, I just judging from like what other people have said about her, I think that she probably still enjoyed working on it because she loved her job. I think she liked what she was doing. And, you know, yeah. and in Austin, all this is that, you know, a lot of people kind of get ahead of this and they don't want to be the ones being blamed for it. But her story is kind of being lost in this. Like she lost her life, you know, a husband doesn't have his wife anymore and her kid doesn't have a mom. And that's, that should be the part that people are really focused on. Take away. Yeah. And I, I do want to go back for a second uh, and, and kind of talk about the, uh, the armor and uh, armor. And I'm sorry, I don't know her name. I should have written uh, it down. Uh, Anna Gutierrez Reed. Um, okay. So, so I want to just touch on that for a second, because I've been on a very low budget film set where I was a first time unit production manager where I was hired right then and there for the first my first film set um for a low budget film and I was this very high position on the set um and it it doesn't really matter what whether this was her first first time doing it or hundredth time doing this job if she's willing to take on this responsibility of being the person in charge of a gun on set multiple guns on set you have to understand that that is a huge responsibility and a huge liability. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to villainize her at all, but I do think that maybe she didn't understand the extent of the responsibility, the power that she had on that set. Right. Because when I first was on a low budget film and being that high of a position, there were mistakes that were made and those were my fault. It doesn't matter if I was 20 years old or 50 years old. Th those were my mistakes. Yeah. I think that, I mean, what I'm wondering is what the culmination of the lawsuit is going to be. Uh, I know they're still investigating it, so there haven't really been any charges set forth, correct? No, yeah, they're still investigating it. And I, yeah. I the crazy thing about the lawsuits, too, is that he made he brought this up in the interview, but like two people who worked on the film have created lawsuits before her husband's even gone for like, a wrongful death like lawsuit like they all filed theirs before 
he's gotten a chance to do it. If anyone should oh. be going after them for her death, it's her husband. Yeah. Like, he should been the first one to do that. And it's not because he doesn't want to take the time to do it. He does. Like, but they shouldn't have been like getting ahead of him. Like this mm -hmm. is a loss. He lost his wife. And yeah. now the now they're and Alec Baldwin is being named in these suits, but I think that has a lot to do with like he has the deeper pockets compared to anyone working on that film. If there's going to be yeah, a settlement, he'll be the one to pay. Yeah, he's a producer as well. Um, the last thing I want to kind of bring up about this that I thought was interesting, um, and he could tell that he got a little annoyed. George Clooney made a comment that he always checks himself whatever guns he's using in a movie. And, and you're not not supposed to yeah. as the actor is not supposed to be checking that right but he they're but, not trained yeah. yeah george clean was trying to say that he checks it just i guess just have an extra set of eyes on it. um you could tell alec baldwin was like it's not, he seemed frustrated but i agree with him that's not his responsibility to do that mm -hmm. um he, it's not at all yeah he's not trained to do it now you can like look it over with the ad or the armor and be like hey let me show you this is what's what's in the gun what's on the gun all that stuff but I think there's going to be a few um, wrongful death lawsuits and maybe reckless endangerment. I'm not sure how far that can extend to. I know most of that is usually done with driving and anything, but I don't know the extent of reckless endangerment when it comes to like just a situation. Um, but at the end of the day, from the interview, what I got from it was I didn't see a whole lot of guilt. Saw mostly... Um, him just trying to push the blame and say this wasn't my fault and not a whole not as much remorse as um maybe he could have shown yeah i kind of yeah i agree i mean like there uh what I, another thing i guess like kind of rubbed me a, a little bit the wrong way is that he wants to make it clear that he didn't do the interview to like come off like a victim but it's kind of hard not to come off that way a little bit when like you are discussing like, how this is what this has done to you and your family and like kind of like what's happening with you, you know, it, it's kind of, I mean, maybe that's not his fault, but it's kind of hard for him not to come off that way a little bit, because at the end of the day, you're doing the interview, so you can kind of get ahead of some of this stuff, so that you want the people to know, like, hey, like, I have no responsibility in this in stance, right, uh, that's where I kind of think that it's the, I think the narrative was a little skewed, and I think that's why it's a lot of people have responded not probably in the way that he wanted to. I know he deleted his Twitter account over the weekend. Yeah. Um, which is funny because, you know, he's a guy that like would say whatever was on his mind on Twitter, no matter what. Um, it's not the first time he's deleted his Twitter. I know. And he can't really take the heat. I'm not saying that, I mean, what he's going through, it, I mean, it does suck. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's not hard on him, but I mean, you've made this public, you did an interview. Like, I think you kind of have to have to deal with like the the backlash the consequence whether it's positive or negative like or what people are going to say about it like you know you can take the yeah. hit, like and people are grieving people grieve in 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 different ways and I, I try not to judge on how people grieve but and if this is his way of grieving then it that's I guess what he needs to do yeah. um because he was he was friends with her as well and they were doing this project together and I, I think it's sad that this is going on, that this is his reaction, but I am trying not to be too hard on anyone involved, mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm just an a very empathetic person, I think. Oh no, and you yeah. did, you've worked on film sets, you worked on independent movies, like you know it, I mean, you know kind of what that is like, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are a lot of people doing multiple jobs and then sometimes on projects like that corners are cut because they're trying to save money um so yeah i agree with you being empathetic i mean i like there a lot of people want someone to blame and i think that um i think it's kind of too early just to be like this is definitely your fault or pointing the finger at anyone i mean i hope i do hope that someone does i do hope that there is some rectification um at the end of the day someone lost their life and someone should be compensated for that. And even if it was an accident, which it was, uh, it's never, no one's not, right. no one's in the clear, I think. And at the end of the day, that's what I think is most important. Um, the movie will never be seen. It will never be made. It's never, there's not a chance it could ever come out, um, which also kind of sucks um, in that sense is that they, seemed like a interesting story that they were trying to tell. Uh, but now there's no chance of that. So 
um, I, I'm really interested to see what happens and kind of what the ramifications are going to be and who's going to end up taking the brunt of it. Right. Um, it just, I, I haven't really seen a lot of people step out of their way to say this, what I, maybe I wasn't a volunteer is kind of what happened with me. I think either you should say something or just keep your mouth shut and Alec Baldwin chose to say something. So um, I also that, want, like future film sets to make some changes too with mm -hmm. these gun regulations yeah, i mean I obviously obviously i'm for stricter gun laws in general but um i think on film sets i think this is going to be a case where we see uh changes with diazzi with the hourly people are working you know 10 to 12 hour days 21 days in a row something needs to change with that as well as guns on set. I mean, technology is so advanced now. We don't, there's no reason that we need, need to have any active guns on set. Yeah, I mean, that's anymore. what he's doing with his movies moving forward. He said that like, there won't be any like actual like guns on set. He said, we can do all the muzzle flashes and stuff in post. Like, he's like, we have the money, we can do it. It's not worth something like this happening. And, you know, I, I mean, I know what Alec Baldwin said. He said like, you know, there's a lot of gun use on sets like you this doesn't happen all the time right like there's several movies where you know this or tv shows where this hasn't happened but like even something like this where it's like oh once every blue moon like it shouldn't happen at all mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um and i think i don't know if you guys agree right i think in the end it's going to come down to where they find out who was responsible for a live round going into the gun and then also whose responsibility was it to check it to make sure that there was nothing like that in the gun. Mm -hmm. To come down to those two things. I, I don't know if they could find out who personally put a live round in that gun. There's also all these rumors that they were doing target practice off set. Like there's a lot of stuff that like we don't know for sure. Cause like they're, you know, they're, it's all kind of rumors, but it's gonna come down to that. I mean, yeah, I think people are talking to the, to the police. I think people are cooperating that were on set that did see they're not doing interviews, which is good, but I think yeah. they, everyone is cooperating. That's good to hear. Well, um, I wanted to touch on it a little bit, and now we can kind of get into a little lighthearted stuff. Uh, I wanted to kind of start with the ladies, because this actually this news actually came out today about Cleopatra, because we were talking about Patty Jenkins directing it, mm -hmm. or I think our first or second episode, and that was when we talked about the whole Star Wars thing. And then they were like, the first story was like, oh, she's too busy. She can't do it. And then we found out later that it might've been uh, creative differences why she was putting that on hold. But now yeah. she's not directing Cleopatra anymore. She's stepping into a producing role. Uh, Carrie Spoglin, who directed uh, episodes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier is now directing. Um, and Deadline said that she, it's because Patty Jenkins wants to focus on Wonder Woman 3 and getting things right with Rogue Squadron. Uh, Rogue Squadron. That yeah. is where her heart was is set, though. Is yeah. Rogue Squadron? Yeah. Uh, it seems like. I mean, I think. I think she might be trying to work out the whatever creative differences she might have had with Kathleen Kennedy. I mean, that's always been an issue with Star Wars stuff. Like, they always say that they want like new ideas and brave creative minds, but then they also like don't mess with the formula. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if you're gonna mess with the formula, like you know, they kind of get involved a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Because it seemed like the Cleopatra one, uh, I don't want to say it was like a passion project, but maybe it might have been. It seemed like she did something she was happy to do, be directing and working with Gal Gadot again. Um, but, you know, maybe if she needs to focus on those two projects more so than this one. And, and maybe and she will have a lot of input as a producer. She might have like a lot of creative input as a producer. She still can. Um, but yeah. She, on camera. Yeah, so do you think that... Um... So they picked this new director based off of um, has was she involved in the project as like an AD or what, what was she? Um, um, how, how did they uh, come about landing on her as as the follow up? Well, I, it doesn't look like she works on this at all. It looks like uh, they basically liked her work on uh, Falcon the Winter Soldier. They thought she had a good eye for what she was doing on that. Um, a good visual eye, and that's why they went with her. And I'm sure, I mean, I would assume that Patty Jenkins had some input in picking her. And, you know, we still yeah. got still a female director doing it. Um, so there's... I was, I was just about to say, I'm glad, I wanted to say that I'm glad that it's going to another female director that 
Agreed. women aren't losing that movie. Right, right. Yeah. That's a big project. Because I think now. it is an important story to tell from a woman's perspective. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's the best way to get the, the right angle of the movie being as Cleopatra, I mean, was one of the most successful women of all time. And I mean, in that time, I don't know if anyone really knows what happened with Cleopatra. I'm still in really interested to see what the story is going to be yeah. because I, I remember studying her growing up uh, in school and everything, but I, I've never really done like some extensive research on everything that she accomplished and sort of what her role was in the um, conquest of Europe and everything like that. So um, very interested to see kind of what what happens. Yeah, I'm kind of. I mean, I think it's. I'm also reading here that the, one of the other reasons they picked her to direct this, they actually thought that the Falcon and the Winter Soldier played more like, even though it was like episodes of the mini they thought it played cinematically, almost like a movie. Mm -hmm. And they really thought that she could bring that kind of cinematic scope to this project. And I think it's kind of cool that they they said on that. And I guess she had, uh, she got her big break directing early seasons of The Handmaid's Tale too. Well. Nice. Um, so she definitely has a good eye. I mean, like, I, I think it was, you know, I have no problem with the choice. And like I said, I'm glad that they kept it with a female director, even if Patty Jenkins can't do it. I'm sure that she's still, like, involved creatively, too. I don't think yeah. she's a producer that just throws in money. I think she wants to kind of be, she just can't do the day-to-day -day directing duties because, you know, she has two other projects. And, you know, I think she wants to finish off Wonder Woman strong because I'm assuming that this third one might be up for her. That'd be it. And then I, yeah. I think she wants to get the Star Wars thing right. So if she wants to focus mm -hmm. on that, more power to her, I think. Yeah, I think she Scott, wants to perfect the projects. Rep, what is that? Scoglin is repped by Anonymous Content, and I've worked with them before. Oh, nice. 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 Just a little fun fact. There you go. Uh, then the other uh, uh, female news I want to point out, because I thought we were talking about like, Halle Berry last week, and uh, we were saying, like, you know, they should put some respect on her name, because, like, she... Oscar winner. She's been in some pretty good movies and she's put in some pretty solid performances. But I even think at someone on her level, I think she kind of hasn't even when winning an Oscar and being one of the better actresses of her generation. I don't think she gets the respect that she nearly deserves. But mm -hmm. Netflix wants to be in business with her moving forward because Bruce did really well. I guess it's opening uh, and on the streamer. They said that 47 at yeah, 47 million viewing hours. Uh, it was number one here in the U.S. Uh, during its first weekend, and then number three globally. And as soon as they got those numbers, they, they gave her a multi-picture deal with the uh, streamer. So she nice. developed yeah. uh, film projects, TV projects, or whatever she wants to do with them. Um, whether or not she's starring in them, or like if she's just going to develop them, like I mean, I'm sure she will want to star in them. But that's a pretty big deal. A lot of big celebrities are inking these kind of multi picture deals with netflix i mean especially with yeah. netflix yeah yeah netflix yeah. is one of the best streaming services to do that with to sign a multi <sighs> multi picture deal with um they let you have the most creative freedom so i've heard so um i think that's a really good opportunity for her and it's incredible i'm really happy for her i bet she probably has a lot of projects that she has wanted to do for a long time that now she's finally mm -hmm. going to be able to get out there and, and um give it to us viewers that was one of the first things i thought when i read this i was like she probably has so many things that she she's probably already pitched to netflix yeah, yeah. She's probably ideas they probably oh, yeah. wanted ideas. Um, yeah they probably wanted like a, a you know a good book of scripts that she's been holding on to that she's ready to make you know they, they didn't just sign this deal and say i hope for the best yeah, yeah i wonder if they like waited for and, and how long, like what their trust level is, because I feel like there's some people that unless you make a hit, you can't sign these big sort of. I mean, Adam Sandler, ha Adam Sandler. Adam, okay. Adam Sandler, yeah. Yeah, That's he <laughs> makes a lot of trash movies. They paid him up front. They're like, here's the money. Just make, make like 10 stupid movies. And he's like, I got you, fam. I got you. <laughs> you so I well. got a bunch of already on the <laughs> show. Netflix forks over all that money because they do really well. I mean, they're like, they, his, I mean, they wouldn't do well in theaters, I don't think, but they kill they it. They make money on streaming services. So, yeah, I mean, there's people like him. I know Mark Wahlberg has stuff with them. Chris Hemsworth, uh, Charlie Theron, Jennifer Lopez actually last year signed a multi-picture deal with them. So, and, and these are pretty big names that they want to be in business with. And I'm 
glad to see that they want to be in business with her because I think that um, <clears throat> she's more than proven herself and now she gets to kind of make some projects that she has probably been wanting to make. And I'm not yeah. saying she's 30 for movies. She still has movies coming out. But like, you know, like, like I mentioned it last week. It but seems these like, are like hers now. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, can do yeah. whatever she wants. Like, you know, it, she was like, she was cool in John Wick 3, right? But that's not like something that she's dreaming to do, right? I mean, it was fun and she got to have fun doing it, but now she gets to do these projects that she is passionate about, which, you know, that's awesome to see, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe she'll finally get some of the respect that she, you can tell that she- I, I, I want to see her in like a very um, non-action dramatic role. Well, just, do you want like a, like a, you want her in a comedy or do you like want a straight like drama or- no, yeah, like a straight drama that's not sort of based around sports or something like that just tells a very dramatic story. Like, I guess the way I could think about it, I know, uh, Brittany, I was talking to you about Nocturnal Animals, um, I, like in a movie kind of similar to that, you know, where um, like just it's it's still got some action in it or something like that, but it more tells a story rather than just being focused around um like a, a sport maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong but that's something that I'd be interested I, in seeing her in see I kind of see your point because she kind of got I think she got pigeonholed a little bit in certain types of movies you know mm-hmm. I, I think she you know she does stuff like x-men like, like those movies and you know she got the first x-men when she she was known but like she kind of like hadn't gotten to the point that she was trying to get to yet and then of course with, with doing movies like that you you get offered more of them sometimes you know like mm-hmm you know, die another day. She does like a Bond movie. And like, you know, yeah. it's, it's you want to do it if you're her because it's the, the brand is so popular and like she can be a part of that. Catwoman, while a major misfire and is not good, I understand the need for her to want to do it because mm-hmm. they're offering you a lead in like a comic book movie. And this was at the time of like, you know, they weren't, it wasn't like Marvel that we have now. Like the comic book movies, like even some of the DC stuff wasn't what it was then like you know they were still kind of trying to find their footing a little bit and yeah she fully admits that it was a misfire she accepted her razzie in person i appreciate anyone that could do that her, her worst actress like award she accepted in person and actually the, the actress we're going to talk about later did the same thing the night before she won her oscar so like it's yeah. it shows a lot of like you know she's in the sense of humor but i but i also think that she kind of she does want that respect though and i think that i i kind of agree with you i kind of want to see her in more stuff that's like more like monsters ball which is what she won her oscar for mm-hmm. uh, like you know that she can really showcase i actually thought she showcased that pretty well in bruise i thought i mean the movie might be like a little cliche but i thought that she was 100 committed and was awesome in the role so it, it is cool that she's kind of getting like you know she'll finally get to do whatever she wants to do and like netflix will probably let her do it because they're all about Creative freedom that way. Yeah, definitely. Good for her. I'm um, excited. Yeah, I kind of want to. Yeah, go- I'm excited to see her to do whatever she wants. I Let think fly. that. Yeah, I I think that <laughs> she, I think she's gonna fly. come up with something. <laughs> I, I think she's gonna have something really cool come out, and I, I support her no matter what. I'm a Stan, Hallie Stan. Hallie Stan. Hallie Stan. Stan for life. <laughs> okay. Hallie Stan for life. I'm going to go through, uh, there's some interesting uh, lists that are coming out. A lot of, some of them are tied to the Oscars, which is like serious movie stuff. Um, I wasn't going to talk about this because like I, I kind of caught on with Brittany that Barstool Sports was trolling with that Christmas list. But I liked what it kind of brought about on Twitter because I didn't realize how many people hate Home Alone 3. So what they did is that they made this top 10 best Christmas movie list of all time. And the first two look, you know, legit, like It's a Wonderful Life and Home Alone. And then you get down to like number six and Home Alone 3 is just chilling in the middle of the pack. hanging there. And not only is it chilling in the middle of the pack, you go further down the list and Home Alone 2 is like chilling at number nine. And no one likes uh, Home Alone 3. Home Alone 3. So like they, they clearly were trolling, but I just love the response that it got from Twitter because so many people feel some type of way about Home Alone 3. Like someone went off on Twitter, like it's not even a fucking Christmas movie. You realize it doesn't even take place during Christmas, but the <laughs> name Home Alone is so synonymous with the holiday. It's, yeah. Yeah, because have you guys actually seen Home Alone 3? I have, and I turned it off yeah. because 
it's <laughs> not i mean it doesn't even have um the original cast not at all and actually one girl one girl on twitter said there is no home alone movies without macaulay Cole. she was like i challenge you to know that kid's name that's in home alone 3 without looking it up i'll wait <laughs> and like yeah he didn't know thing. <laughs> Uh, the biggest. I thing just like. I, I refuse to give this list. I refuse to give this barstool list like any attention because I think it's such a troll thing to like. They clearly just were joke. just trying to get people angry, and I was like, "This is dumb." It yeah, worked. I thought it, was, I thought it was funny that like one guy mm-hmm. from Twitter, he was like, "Y'all, y'all talking about Home Alone three, and look at Fred Claus just chilling right there." <laughs> Fred Claus, yeah. <laughs> people just get so people get so worked up about these like lists that a random guy is just creating a list of like the ten best movies of blah blah blah, and like people just go so hard in the paint with all these lists, and I'm like. Who let me make a list? No one will give a shit. <laughs> no, I think like I mean, these this lists was, come out every year. This one was definitely satirical for sure. It, it, was, it was just meant it to was get from like the people. organ, like film, like some random like organ film association or something. Yeah, I, I think it was definitely like <laughs> meant to just spark some controversy on the internet, which it definitely did. It did work. Um, I don't know if we trended all day. <laughs> I just refuse to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, 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 I forgot, even though I've seen Home Alone 3, I forgot that Scarlett Johansson's in it. It's like one of her earlier roles. She plays his sister. And that was the only, I, and, uh, and Roger Ebert actually gave it three stars. He did not give Home Alone or Home Alone 2 three stars. He actually liked really? Home Alone 3 more than the Home Alone 1 or 2. And I don't want to well, you know, know he was going Alone. downhill for a while. So yeah. <laughs> I don't want to speak ill of, but no longer with us. But I, I don't, don't either. How- but towards the end of his life, you know, <laughs> I don't know how. I think Scarlett wants to scrub that from her filmography. Yeah, you, you I'm sure. Three stars and not Home Alone. Maybe Home Alone too. You're like, yeah, it's it's just a rehash of Home Alone. But even then, that, mm-hmm. that movie is pretty much perfect. Well, it's in New York. That one's awesome. Yeah, and it probably feels more it's like. How did this family keep losing this other. kid? <laughs> right. Yeah, it really shows so much they really love their son. <laughs> They leave him at least in Home Alone three. He's home alone with like the chicken box. Like it's, it's, not, it's, like gonna, they, it's not like they forgot him. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be like they're gonna make another one. It's like Home Alone ten rehab. I know. It's, uh... <laughs> to really consider how forget like... he's in rehab. Yeah, <laughs> where's Kevin? He, yeah, he's just the child they disown. Um, <laughs> but a more important list. Uh, it kind of can be a precursor for the Oscars. It's not always, but uh, the National Board of Review. Uh, did their list of uh, like best film actor and actor work this year? Um, best film they put they gave it to Licorice Pizza. I haven't seen it yet, but it's Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie, guy who directed Boogie Nights and Magnolia, and There Will Be Blood. Uh, he has a pretty awesome photography. Um, mm-hmm. It's been getting a lot of attention, mostly because over Thanksgiving weekend when it He's opened, married to Maya Rudolph. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know that <laughs> until yeah, I didn't know that until like today. Uh, yeah. I wonder where they met. Um, he but, worked for SNL. He used to like write a little bit for SNL. I think that's how they met. That's so cool. And uh, the movie actually is only playing in New York and LA right now at four locations, but it had uh, over Thanksgiving weekend the best per theater screen average of the pandemic, like eighty three thousand dollars per theater, which wow. like, indie movies are not seeing that right now. Um, mm-hmm. so it's like Paul Thomas Anderson. They say he's a marquee director. Like when you hear about Paul Thomas Anderson, you want to go see his movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what's kind of happening here. He also was named best director by them. Uh, they named Will Smith as best actor for King Richard, uh, and uh, best actress was Rachel uh, Zegler from uh, She's the Lead in West Side Story. It's kind of a late in the game uh, West Side Story is a little bit, um, but it's they think that it might be a big presence during the war season because uh, the reviews for it were much better than I thought they were going to be. I was kind of reluctant about West Side Story even. Even though Spielberg is doing it, I and I saw the first trailer and I still wasn't convinced, but it has a 95% of Rotten Tomatoes right now. It's the early reaction to it. They call it like top tier Spielberg. And they have actually been praising her a lot. Nice. So, um, you know, it's a it's um uh, it's whether or not you really want to musicals haven't really done well on the big screen in a little bit, like in the heights didn't really make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But this is Spielberg and it's coming out during the holiday. Like it's, it opens like this Friday and they'll play well throughout December. So 
I'm sure it'll make some money, and I, I'm, the good reviews will probably help with that, too. I think it's definitely going to make a lot of money during Christmas season, for sure. Yeah. Uh, anytime and Spielberg, Spielberg attached to it. And Spielberg is uh, synonymous with the Oscars. I mean, he's on the board, yeah. so <laughs> he's always nominated because he he's even nominating himself. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I yeah. like Spielberg. I like, it's, I like him a lot, but I do think that, I mean, I, we said this last time, but the award season is all, po- it's all politics. And mm-hmm. when you're nominating yourself and then you're excluding streaming services because Steven Spielberg has been known to be very against streaming services being nominated for Oscars, um, it, it kind of limits the people that are nominated and he's obviously going to put himself up there. And then it's just going to be, I mean, it's this rehash of another story that's already been told. And I was talking with my brother about this because we saw the trailer when we were, um, when we saw Dune over Thanksgiving and it's just like, why does this rehash have, it, it feels like it's more of a spectacle than anything. It's like, Oh, this is such a, like we have, 900 extras that are all dancing in the streets and i don't know for for some reason that it, it's it seems like a cop-out to me and I, I i'm guessing that it's probably really well done he's a great director the music is classic so it's going to be the same story but with new people and probably really good acting and everything i just it's not something that i am dying to go see because it's just it, it really lacks creativity, it seems like to me, but that's just kind of my opinion of, of the whole thing. Plus, it's coming out late and it's Spielberg, so he'll get great recommendations from it anyway. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I was, you know, I was not, con- I, it took, I, when I first heard about it, I wasn't sold on it. When I first saw the first two trailers, I wasn't completely sold on it. I did like the idea. I, I love the story of the, the lead actress who she's never, acted, I mean, she's never been in a feature film before she answered a thing on Twitter about auditioning and that's how they found her. And crazy. she's so impressed the people doing like the dailies that they were seeing of her led to her being cast in like the live action Snow White that they're doing. Like, and it wasn't even like a full movie. They were like, they were like, can we see dailies of this girl? And they cast her on that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for her. It seems like a really yeah. sort of cool story that kind of you come from, you know, she was like a high school student and all of a sudden now she's in a Steven Spielberg movie. Life is changed forever. And Rita Marie, Rita Marina, Rita Marina was in it too, which is good to have, you know, she's the original, she's the OG um, Maria. So like she's to have her a part of that project is really special and to have her promoting it. She's, she's like 80 something years old and she's going around doing press for this movie. Yeah, she's as vibrant as she ever was. I mean, like I was watching some interviews mm-hmm. with her. And I think she kind of threw some shade <laughs> towards Natalie Wood's way because they were talking about the the lead girl, like you know, oh, like how great she was and you know how you know how really good she is in the film. And then like Rita Moreno just chimed in. They're like, "Yeah, she's played by a Latina." <laughs> I was like, and they're like, the person doing the interview was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> and it's not. It's a true statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know I, that representation was important for Steven Spielberg and his team working on it. They were very, they took a lot of direction from people in the know a little bit more. Like, oh, well, we're not. They didn't want to just do it and like cast you know the wrong people. And, I, and like one of the girls in the movie talked about how she's like Afro Latina and she wanted to explain that to him. And like he, she said that he was just so receptive to wanting to do it right and like do justice by you know everyone that was in it. He wanted to mm-hmm. represent them in the right in the right way, which you know he kind of went through that a little bit when he did the color purple, which like in the eighties was like, you know, dominantly black cast. They, a lot of people didn't think he was the right choice to direct the color purple because of mm-hmm. the subject matter. And but I heard even when he did that movie that he was very keenly aware of you know what he needed to get right, and like you know he of course he's Spielberg he doesn't want to like ruffle feathers like I think yeah. he, I think out of most of the big directors he has ruffled the less feathers <laughs> and i think probably keep it that way um but i think it's yeah. cool he kind of like if that was important for him to get it right because in someone in his position if they got it wrong you know he would be you know public enemy number one on that 
saying you didn't do this right you didn't represent us right i just think his i think his like class of directors um you know all these older white men that are still directing are so hard to deal with now like for me to when they're so against streaming services and them having any rights for award season it just really rubs me the wrong way because the streaming services gave an opportunity for more diversity and more people, more inclusion, more people have jobs. And for them to say, oh, they're not real movies. They don't need to be considered for awards. It's kind of a slap in the face to like everything that he is representing with diversity. But then he's like, I want to limit people from accessing the awards. It's like, it's kind of just like, what side are you on? Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like a director should want that creative ability out there and for anyone who has an idea to make a movie and like just because he's been successful in the past I mean it's I hate to say like similar to um like hazing but it's like when you're when people are in a fraternity or something like that they treat the people below them worse because they're like they should have had to go through what I had to go through and just because things have changed doesn't mean that those people are any less talented are any less creative, any less able to create something that is unbelievable and and well done. So I I do agree with you, Brittany. It kind of sucks that he's like, well, this is the way that movies have always been made. and They're not doing it the right way. It's like, well, you should be able to give people- Technology's changing. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's 2021, it's not 1991. I mean, things Mm -hmm. are so different now. It's it's yeah. just insane. Yeah. I agree with you, Owen, 100%. That's a really good analogy. He has always been with this. Like he, he's always said that they shouldn't be nominated for Oscars, Netflix movies. They should be nominated for Emmys because they are movies that are being made for TV. Um, that is why Netflix now... Totally disagree. Netflix, because of that, if they want some of their movies to be considered for awards attention, they'll release them in like a few select theaters before they hit the streaming service so they can actually be counted as like theatrical releases that can get nominated for. And a lot of that has to do with like what he said. Like a lot, like he was like, you know, they they shouldn't qualify for Oscars because they're not movies that are being made for like the theatrical experience. They're being made to be watched at home. And that was, that's been his argument. I know like other directors- have That should change. Yeah, other directors have fallen in line with that. Like Christopher Nolan has a really a big stink against streaming services, but that's because he said he makes his movies- And from, like- like you know, I, I get the argument, but I also think that they need to kind of catch up to the times before they get left behind. <laughs> I mean, Mars Streaming Services- services also gives like accessibility to people who can't go into a movie theater and they can stay home and like read the subtitles or, you know, if they don't speak English or, you know, they can watch it at home if they're deaf. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, they're, it's giving them all these accesses to different accessibility. And these streaming services are, are not going anywhere. If anything, they're gonna take over. So, yeah. especially with COVID, we learned that. So you either have to ride the wave or get out of the ocean, like get yeah. out of the way. Yeah, yeah and, and to, to your point too, Brittany, it's like, not just the people that, might not be able to enjoy it in the theater, like people who are hard of hearing, deaf or anything like that. But let's just say you live in the middle of nowhere in Kansas and you still enjoy watching movies, but there might not be a theater that you can go to that's close. So, I mean, that gives them the ability, like they have internet. So why don't you, why shouldn't you want to get the widest reach possible to have anyone come and see her and watch her movies rather than just people that live in large metropolitan areas? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in case you didn't know already, I mean, I think the last year, like 2020, showed how important streaming services are when there were no movie theaters to go to. Totally. There there was no one, that that was the only way people were getting content. And it kind of showed how important those services are. Like they, it's, there's no denying that like, they're here to stay and they're not going anywhere. And I think with some of them that they're doing now that are smart, like Disney Plus does it, HBO Max is doing it. They're, I mean, I guess they're in the position where they can because HBO Max has Warner Brothers and Disney, of course, has Disney. But they've been able to tie their streaming TV shows to the movies that they're releasing. So, like, they are, like, these exist all in the same, like, universe. Like, they have mm-hmm. two spinoffs already in development for TV, for the streaming services at HBO Max, for the Batman. There's two shows that they're already doing that would just be tied to that movie. 
Disney Plus has done it with all the Marvel shows. Like these are TV shows, but they're also tied to the movie. So like that's just another way to get more people to watch them. I think if like Netflix, if they all could kind of figure that out to kind of cross promote in that way. Like mm-hmm. I think that's pretty smart. I mean, I, I think they're kind of open to the fact that, hey, these are people watching this at home is just as important as someone that's going to go to the theater to see some of this stuff. I think it's a genius mm-hmm. idea too, because from what they're doing with HBO Max, like I know they have the Peacemaker um, show that's coming out. So, I mean, people like the Suicide Squad, but I don't know if people would have lined up to go see a Peacemaker movie and maybe have it get in uh get that much viewership and so i mean also what we were talking about a couple episodes ago there are some things that would be better that the story has kind of mentioned this character but their story needs more development with the tv series and so i think that what they're doing and gays you hit it right on the head it's like they're kind of leading this innovation of basically you can put a movie out and have a movie a sequel and now like three shows tied to this one idea so i i think that that's something mm-hmm. that I, I don't think they're all going to work, but I think that a lot of them are going to, they're just going to be this big money churning machines. Yeah. I mean, I'm watching Hawkeye right now and like it's three episodes in of its six. And, you know, you have a character that's been in all these Avengers movies, like Jeremy Ritter hasn't really gotten his due in those movies. Like I, I would say that they've kind of underutilized him, mm-hmm. but this show gives you the opportunity to like, of course they're using it as a way to introduce Kate Bishop, like Haley Steinfeld, but it's also done a good job of fleshing him out. And you know the, the writer of that show said that there are plenty of stories to still tell with him. This is not about like passing the torch to her and then like being like, all right, he's done. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like these shows give you an opportunity to get to know them more. I mean, like same thing with WandaVision. Like, well, you got to know more about Scarlet Witch and even Vision on that show because it was just solely dedicated to, yeah. and not just a two-hour movie where they're supporting players or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's. It's smart. And it gives so many opportunities for people to work. I mean, there's, it opens up so many jobs. Yep. It's just, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so hard. LA is so filled with people trying to work in this industry. And when you limit it to only theatrical films that they can do, it's like now that we have series after series coming out that, that opens up so many jobs. I agree. So when did Gay, uh, Gaius, when did um, Spielberg make that? statement because was that like recent? 2019 okay i was gonna say i was i wonder i wonder what his opinion would be now and if he it might been, it been been earlier I, I remember when like I, since covid i would love to hear his thoughts like what yeah. he did during covid yeah, it could have mm-hmm. been earlier because like, i'm wondering because like it he was, probably sat in his mansion netflix became like a big presence like for oscar season because they were actually even they were like releasing movies that were getting that kind of attention and it was when that be, kind of became the main story that he said what he said um you know i i think his defense to this would be because you know he held off west side story you know he watched it get moved around because of covid it's possible that he i don't even think it was an option for them to even try to sell it to a streaming service at all because he probably yeah. would know um but it, it seems like he, i don't know if he's against streaming service i think he's it against, was march 2019 yeah i think he's again i just looked it up making movies for streaming services I think he would make TV shows for them. He has no problem with that. I think it's the idea of like, he basically are calling them TV movies rather than being like, the Netflix stuff is being made with some of the same budgets as like a theatrical release. Like Red Notice costs he more. Said, he <laughs> said this, he, he made this comment because Roma was like being, in 2019 when Roma was like the biggest movie oh, ever. The war season. I mean, it won best picture. Mm-hmm. But it was a Netflix original. Yeah, and he uh, he felt. I mean, he's not. I mean, he's not alone in his feeling about this streaming stuff. He, I mean, it's mostly the older people, except for Scorsese, who's working with Apple. I think it's just because like Apple and him have that agreement of like, hey, it gets like a little theatrical rollout, and then it's exclusively yours on the on the platform. But at least some of them aren't like totally being left behind. I think a lot like anyone smart enough will see how important like it those services are and they are a big part of like the future of cinema not just tv yeah i think i mean the the whole industry is just consistently changing and we saw that over the last couple years but i think that some of these older directors are trying to 
stay in their ways and try and say, hey, well, this is how it's always kind of been done and, and we should continue to do that. I know it was different for a couple of years, but now we're getting kind of getting back to it, but they're going to get left behind. And I, I'm actually really more, a lot more excited for these smaller independent, just really creative projects that are coming out because they're available to be bought by streaming services. Yep. They don't have to deal with studio. Yeah. They can kind of like do make the stuff that they want. And then Netflix is like notorious. Like everyone that's worked with them said that they stay out of the way. They let you make what you want to make. Now, whether mm -hmm. or not, not, not every Netflix original is golden. Like some of them are great, but like, I mean, to have that freedom as like a director, writer, like producer or like whatever, or even as an actor and stuff, like to have that freedom of like this big entity is just going to let me make what I want to make. And they're going to leave me alone like that. I think that's a dream for most people working in the industry because oh yeah, as you guys know, like I mean, studio interference is a huge problem for a lot of movies because they think they know, <laughs> they think they know better because you know they have the money. <laughs> uh, and a lot of times they don't know better. Sometimes their notes tend to sink certain movies in the long run. Oh, it happens yeah. a lot with comic book movies. I mean, they will interrupt, they will uh, Warner Brothers has done this a lot with their DC stuff where they've interfered to the film's detriment. And that's something that doesn't really happen at Netflix. And yeah. I guess why a lot of people are keen about working with them. Yeah. Take the products that they want to make. Um, before we get into our little news segment, there's a couple of casting news things I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring up Tom Holland and not about Spider-Man because Tom Holland confirmed that he uh, is going to play Fred Astaire in an upcoming biopic, which uh, if you know anything about Fred Astaire, I think the casting is pretty spot on. Tom Holland actually is a pretty good dancer. I did not. I only saw the stuff from Limpsey Battle, so I thought that was all he could do. But <laughs> apparently he, like, uh, the other people who have talked about him said that he's a very, very good dancer. Um, right. Sony Pictures is making it, so that keeps him in business with them, with Spider-Man and Uncharted. Um, they are filling his pockets. Uh, I th and I think that's, I, I think he, Amy Pascal loves that she was a producer on Spider-Man. She used to run Sony she loves Tom Holland. I think that she champions him because she thinks he's a good actor, all this stuff. And she was one of the people, she made it no secret that she wanted him for that part. Um, and I also think it's kind of cool for her that he gets to stay put at Sony. Probably still working out those checks for the Spider-Man, those three Spider-Man movies that they wanted. 100%. To <laughs> um, but I, pardon me, when I heard this story, I was like, I wonder if they were like, hey, like, we'll let you do this if you sign on for those three spider-man movies yeah <laughs> uh so that's that, that's always that kind of deal that goes into making a project like that but i think it's pretty good casting in general i mean he, i think he it'll be interesting i mean you say he's a good dancer but i i don't see anything on his resume that would prove that <laughs> so to play the best dancer besides lip sync lip sync battle right. to play like the best he's like known for being the best dancer in the world like that ever lived like I he's got some work to that's do. That's a that's a reach. Yeah, I, he's got to do some training because I don't see anything on his resume that actually proves that he's a good dancer. Yeah, and Fred Astaire yeah. is like you know the Being honest. Fred Astaire was uh, the king of that. Um, it's hard to top that. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure he'll do fine and he'll train. And uh, I just think like if this were, a, I think that if this were like roles reversed for like a female. I think we would be really, I think not us, but I think the media would be really hard on a woman playing an iconic character like that. They the would say, oh, the shoes are so big. Got to fill these big shoes. Mm -hmm. And like, I think Tom Holland, I don't know if he can fill Fred Astaire's shoes. I'm going to be, I mean, he's a great actor, but I don't know. I guess it depends who else they cast in this movie. Who's going to play mm -hmm. Ginger. Right. Um Ginger Rogers, if she's in it, if there's a role for her in there, like, I, I don't know. We only know one person that's going to be in this movie. We don't even have a director attached to it yet. This is also, yeah. early. it's very early in development. Like he, he made the comment um, while uh, I think at some, at, I don't know if it was like a premiere for Spider-Man or if it was a, some kind of ceremony where he mentioned it. Um, he said, like a weird flex. Yeah. He's he out of nowhere. He just sent the script from Amy Pascal. He hasn't even read it yet um and he I'm said sure they, yeah I'm sure, about the, I'm sure they talked about the project though i'm like i'm sure they if this wasn't like the first like she's like oh, i got something to send you and you know check it out when you're done promoting that other big movie that we're doing yeah. 
But uh, I just think they shouldn't have mentioned it yet. Then I don't know. Yeah, it seems kind of weird. I don't think yeah. he's supposed to mention it. And a part of me wants to think it was kind of like, well, you mentioned that we're doing three Spider-Man movies. I haven't confirmed it, so I'm going to confirm this. <laughs> uh, people just people mm-hmm. love him, so I think that they're just trying to get his name out there as much as possible and basically say, hey, listen, he's still around. He's going to be continuing to make movies for us, for Sony. <laughs> Someone made a comment, though. They were like, why is Tom Holland and Timothy Chalamet cast in everything? <laughs> they, uh, they, I mean, but they are kind of pretty popular. The new, the generation the new young names. Yeah. And I feel that way a little bit. I agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I do. I, I love seeing. Like, why didn't they cast someone who can dance in that role? <laughs> yeah, well, he, already. He know yeah. How to, I mean, like being good at being being a dancer on a on Dancing with the Stars or whatever the fuck you said is yeah. not <laughs> a good dancer. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it if you watch, make video, you a good holds, dancer. He holds his own in the video. I'm just saying. <laughs> if you look, he fake twerks to Rihanna's umbrella. That's all he does. That doesn't make her a good. <laughs> Good, make you well, a video. stairs is rolling in his grave right now. I think hearing you t- you say that he's comparable to Fred Astaire right now, he needs yeah. to put in some work. It's already sure. a failure. As good as Fred Astaire, I'm just saying he could train and like look like he's as good. <laughs> like it's acting. I don't know. I'm just yeah. trying to. I'm trying to think of like a female equivalent role that like people have been really hard on someone for playing and i can't really i can't think of any right now someone real yeah Uh, well i think that i mean the first one that comes to mind was margot robbie and i tonya but she did a really good job with that yeah she actually she actually did a good job of humanizing her a lot of people didn't like tanya harding and they saw that movie and they were like oh like maybe we were i love that movie Uh, yeah I'm trying to think of one where they really come after them for not portraying them correctly. I think it just depends. Like, you know, Jennifer Hudson, like, was cho- like was chosen by Aretha Franklin to be her in respect. Uh, so she didn't really have to deal with any of that. I, I can't think of a woman off the top of my head. Like, it, you know, she got cast in something comparable to this where they were like, like, oh, I hope she can carry her weight. Like, I hope she's good enough. Like, Tom Holland's yeah. not really doing that today. I, I looked online trying to find any naysayers. And a lot of people were just thought he'd be perfect for it. And they were just saying that based on like the look and like they think he's talented and like he's a good actor. He can pull it off. Uh, it's still so early. It's still very early. And um, like I said, I don't, I think he, I, I don't oh, think he's I just talk. remembered one. What? Beanie Feldstein. Oh, for, uh, for the impeachment thing? No, no, no. She was, she's going to be in um, Funny Face. Speaking of Fred Astaire. Oh yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. Aren't they remaking that movie? That. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. I think I think if it, the news was about someone, if everyone that I read online seemed to be happy with him doing it, they weren't like, like he can't like fill for the stairs dancing shoes. Like there was none of that that I saw. Um, I don't know. I'm hesitant. We'll see what happens. I'm gonna be the harsh critic today good <laughs> my hangover is doing that to me <laughs> doing that to you uh and then the last bit of casting news uh no one really knows about m night Shyamalan's next movie it's called uh it's like the knock in the cabin uh like most m night Shyamalan movies they're all very mysterious and we won't know what they're about until a month before they come out but Dave Bautista is in it and I thought it was interesting that he mm. Dave Bautista has talked a lot about uh the roles he chooses to do and the people he chooses to to work with because a lot of people have compared him like when they were like hey would you ever do a movie with like Dwayne Johnson or John Cena and he has kind of been negative and like he's like well I want to make real movies <laughs> like basically yeah. they don't make real movies you know and this is why he's worked you know he worked with uh Bill and the that he did with Dune he worked with him on Blade Runner as well so he's and he's worked with James Gunn and Guardians of the Galaxy and like he wants to work with like really good people that being said, I think he takes himself a little too seriously. Like, agreed. Uh, it's okay to like kind of like be in like a silly act. Like he's he's doing like a like Lethal Weapon style like cop movie with Jason Momoa. They actually there was a bidding war for it like a few weeks ago. So like, I don't like the kind of like flippant thing that he kind of does when he's like, oh well, I want to be in real stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say that he's very he's very picky and like he wants. I'm sure. He read a script for M. Night Shyamalan's next movie and liked it. M. Night Shyamalan has kind of redeemed himself in a lot of ways in the last... I mean, Old got mixed responses, but before that, he had 
kind of. I was gonna say I don't think old did too well in theaters. Yeah, it, I mean, it, they they try to blame it on the fact that it was like when we were getting movies back during the summer, and it was like kind of people aren't sure about going to the movies. It made ninety million dollars worldwide. I don't think it was like a lot to make, but it mm-hmm. made less than like his previous like like three releases. Yeah, but, uh, I saw it in theaters. But uh, did you like it? I. Uh... It was it was good. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of twisted. It was a little twist. I mean, M M Night Shyamalan does a really good job of like, you know, the ending is kind of predictable, but then there's also like some sort of weird twist also to go with Lisa's it. So open ending. I think he did a really good job with his the twist in the movie because there is a big um, reveal at the end, and I think the way that he did it, it was. It, he was in it which he's always kind of in it like makes himself a character but. yeah i thought the idea was better than the execution is what i will that's say. fair um mm-hmm. uh, he's like he's hit or, he's really hit or miss like he either will hit hard and it's great like six cents or you didn't like avatar the last airbender man Good God, no. <laughs> or lady in the water or the happening where people were like afraid of houseplants and killing themselves. <laughs> like it was just yeah. sometimes he could like I I and he's also one of those people that has no one to really check him. Like he writes all his stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So I think he thinks that his ideas, of course, because they're his, are like amazing. Mm-hmm. Going to keep him in check. And sometimes someone's he, like, all right, M night. Someone needs to keep him in check sometimes. And then mm-hmm. someone kept him in check, we probably wouldn't get stuff like The Village or The Happening or Lady in the Water or that other, or what was that one to do After Earth, like with Will Smith and his son? Like that was bad too. That was horrible. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're a victim of your own success. And like he had very quick success very early on with Sixth Sense. And, you know, he would, became this new kind of hit filmmaker that everyone wanted to see what he, what, what he's going to do next. And he mm-hmm. kind of kept that momentum up through Unbreakable and then Signs, and then we start to see cracks. <laughs> yeah. Like some people think he's a one trick pony because uh, he relies heavily on twists and stuff like that. That's all he's got. That's pretty much all he's got. But I mean, he, if when he does it, like I said, he does it well when he does it really well. And then other times, mm-hmm. dude, you need like someone to like proof what you're writing. Yep. He cut some stuff for you. Like, so, yeah, <laughs> I think you put a great list. I'm going to keep him in check. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're actually going to start something new today. Um, this is actually Owen's idea, or was it your brother's idea? But since you're a twin, so it's like basically you're the same person. <laughs> so it's like, well, um, we just kind of talked about some <laughs> something that would be uh, kind of a fun little segment on the podcast, and um, coming up with basically kind of giving our stamp of approval for either specific movies or specific actors, and so. Um, really wanted to kind of dive into um, actor and actresses filmography and everything that they've kind of done and then kind of give our scores each based on what we've liked and what we've seen um, and kind of give a back to the blockbuster approved sort of uh, a rating for that and just kind of um, and then hopefully spark some interest and have anyone who's listening want to comment um, see what they have to say and just kind of start opening a dialogue for um just just any any type of uh, per- and then also give some suggestions to us for who we should try and uh, look over next i like that idea too i like uh getting people more involved and having them pick because you can do you can do we can do actors actresses directors or even just a movie itself we can, like, kind mm-hmm. of, uh you know it'll be more fun if we disagree i kind of have a feeling with this one i want to start easy um mm-hmm. I think this one we'll all agree on. I would love to. Thanks for asking. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> she was like, thank you. Can we go I that? always disagree. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, just like, you know, like I want to be an Oscar winner one day. That's what I'm working on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to start it because she has a film coming out this Friday, right? On Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to start with Sandra Bullock. Uh, she is going to be in the Unforgivable on Netflix. I'm sure it'll do really well because she's one of those, you know, before Red Notice, uh, Bird Box was the most watched uh, Netflix movie in this first 28 days. Yep. Uh, so she had that distinction and already having worked with them. I, I don't think that movie's a renter, but we can probably get to that a little bit later. Did that yeah. movie come out? Did that movie come out during the pandemic? No, it came out a year right before. before. 
yeah, I think. It oh. Was, oh, right. Was it was it 2019 going to? For some reason, I associate it with the pandemic. Maybe maybe people just watched it. Was it was either very late 2019 or very early 2020. Oh, I'll look it up right now. Uh, it came out December 21st, 2018. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. A lot, Damn, of, I, a lot of people have like negatively compared that movie to A Quiet Place because they think it's like the same kind of... It's the, I mean, it is. Uh, but that movie was <laughs> insanely popular on Netflix. I, I mean, I don't love it, but I, I just remember everyone was... I don't know if they were just like caught up with how absurd the movie was or if mm-hmm. it was good, uh, but it was insanely popular. Um, but um, a lot of people used to label Sandra Bullock uh, back in the day when she first started. She got compared a lot to Julia Roberts. She was given the America's Sweetheart label because they kind of... Mm-hmm follow the same almost career trajectory with romantic comedies and very likable. Uh, I think I think they both kind of had that problem where their likability um, worked in their favor a lot in the beginning. And then then it became like, like when we go down some of her movies, a lot of critics start to be like, well, is she is she only likable? Like, can she actually stretch? Can and she like, act? Can she act? Um, of course, she's proven that with like some of her other roles. But in the beginning, it was like the thing that they loved her for uh they started to kind of like hold against her mm-hmm. um, but uh she actually got her start um i won't go through like her like early early stuff but like she became uh she came into like public attention she was in demolition man in 1993 yeah with sylvester stallone and wesley snipes most of the reviews like i said pointed out just how likable she was uh yeah. and she stole a lot of her scenes because of her just natural likability and stuff. Um, she became even more well known to people a year later when she did Speed. Uh, yep. She came out in 1994. No one was expecting it to be a big hit, and it turned into a huge, huge hit. Um, also, completely sold on her likability, but they loved her chemistry with Keanu Reeves, um, and that kind of made her almost an instant star, like overnight. Yeah. Where like her her first few movies after like she did she does Speed. While you were sleeping, the net, uh, and a time to kill, pretty much back to back to back, and they all make a lot of money. Yeah, um, the net doesn't hold up. I we <laughs> yesterday. While you're uh, sleeping, while you're sleeping is my mom's favorite movie, so I've seen that a, a million times, and I think it's cute. Yeah, I think it's I think it's good too. She got nominated for a Golden Globe for it for best actress in the musical or comedy. Um, I think that movie also just shows how I. I don't want to take anything away by saying someone's likable because I think that it's a talent in itself to kind of like when you can just kind of light up the screen like that when you're not maybe not naturally as talented as some of your counterparts but like if you can kind of grab someone's attention based on like just your natural screen presence I think that says a lot too. I think that men I think that men get called that a lot and it's never held against them. Right. Like uh, the person that comes to mind is Ryan Reynolds is known and they were in a movie together as well but ryan reynolds comes to mind because he's so likable but no one's ever like is he too likable where he can't do this movie or whatever no one says that is he trying too hard or yeah people just like him Mm -hmm. and that's that's it yeah I, i think that he does he does a good job stealing scenes uh especially when he's with other big names i think sandra bullock does it better um because she really has the ability to kind of play to other people's strengths um and not continue to be just the same person like brian reynolds who's kind of the same in everything um whereas Mm -hmm. she can really dictate um kind of what what role she's playing based on what's written for her and continue to be likable while also expanding her reach and and the way that she's kind of portraying the role I think a good example of that is uh, I don't know if you guys seen the Heat with her and Melissa McCarthy. Yeah, she plays she plays she's funny. Person in that like she's not the outlandish one, like Melissa McCarthy is. But Sandra Bullock is funny in it because she is playing it so straight, and like she kind of like she basically like kind of serves up these jokes to Melissa McCarthy, but they they work really well together because she's not necessarily trying to steal a spotlight from her. Like she knows what her role is, mm-hmm. and. Playing the straight person in the movie like that is funny because yeah. you, you're, you're thinking to yourself, like, I'm laughing because she's fucking absurd. Like, why aren't you? But, like, the fact that she has to maintain it's kind of like, you know, 
if until towards the end there she does lighten up like towards the end of the movie but like for the most part she is the straight person compared to Melissa McCarthy and she kind of is a good asset to her in that movie in that regard that like, movie did really well I was actually working in a theater my my first job when that uh that movie came out yep and uh I will I, I also want to say this too about like a time to kill when she was in that just to show how like uh how big her star power power was at that time um she got top billing on a time to kill even though she's not the lead uh she uh she's featured a lot on the posters and her name is listed first in the trailer her name is first on the poster um but matthew mcconaughey is a star of that movie but it was his first big big yeah it was his his big break Samuel L. Jackson is, has an even bigger role in that movie, but, you know, he wasn't quite, I mean, this was after Pulp Fiction, but he wasn't quite Samuel L. Jackson that we know today yet. I would even mm-hmm. say Kevin Spacey has more screen time than her in A Time to Kill, but that's just, like, just the power of, like, who she was then. Like, her name above a title at that time meant that your movie Don't was too well. Um, it's not like it's a thankless role, but it's just not, she's not the lead. And, mm-hmm. like, I would say maybe she has, like, 20 minutes of screen time if that it's it's spread out pretty well to very it seems like she's in it more um but yeah i mean that's just how popular she was at that time yeah she hits her first speed bump no pun intended she does a speed two cruise control in 1997 she admits later that she only did it because they paid her 11 million dollars and sounds like a good reason to do it for me i would have done it too yeah, <laughs> yeah yep. she wanted um financial backing for her next movie which was hope floats so that's why she ultimately decided to do it she regrets doing it she makes fun of it uh, at least she has a good sense of humor about it not being great uh keanu reeves did not come back for that it was jason patrick who was the guy it was missing that chemistry between the two of them mm-hmm. also it's a movie called speed on a cruise ship so that makes zero sense yep uh, <laughs> uh uh but i mean but it was her first kind of misfire and when you have a misfire like that that is when your critics start to kind of turn on you because right after she did Speed 2, she does Hope Floats and Practical Magic. What a fun transition. <laughs> a movie about a cruise and then Hope Floats. And then Hope Floats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she does Hope Floats and Practical Magic. They both make, well, Hope Floats makes money because it didn't cost a lot to make. Practical Magic opened well, but then kind of faded really quickly. Uh, and this Practical movie, Magic, though, is that. now... Practical Magic, I want to talk about this for a second because it is now a cult classic. It is. Like that movie, that movie is known now as a good Halloween movie. People binge, people watch it for the first time now and they're like, this movie is so great. And it's one of those movies that didn't do well at the time, but now it's like just a classic rewatchable movie. Mm -hmm. If you guys haven't seen it, you need to. Nicole Kidman's in it. I love Practical Magic. I think it's really underrated. I do too. I agree with you too. I think it has gone on to become like a cult classic since it came out. Like a lot of people like mm-hmm. respect it a lot more now than they did then. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the time, like she does, like Hope Floats makes money, like I said, but then critics start to kind of, one guy said that she's only really good at doing light drama and comedy. She should stick to that. Is mm. what he said about her and Hope Floats. And basically- they, that's you said everyone, a guy said that? A guy said that, yeah. <laughs> a man. Uh, she she becomes, like like I said, the thing that she was known for, like what made her famous, her like, ability, it starts to work against her. Uh, and like actually more of her projects after this. She does Forces of Nature with Ben Affleck. It makes money, but critics don't like it. Have the same complaints about her and that like she's just writing her like ability and all Playing that. The same, same role. Yeah. Uh, she does 28 Days, which actually was a little bit of a stretch for her. She, it's a comedy, but she plays like an a, a alcoholic and she goes to uh, AA and stuff. It's, like, it is funny, even though there are some dramatic moments in it. And I actually think that movie actually shows that she has like a lot of dramatic potential, even though the movie itself is a comedy. But even that wasn't... I know. think it started to show her range a little bit more. Yeah, it started to show her range. I think so. Um, critics didn't pay much attention to it because, again, they were... There was some reason they were like, oh, she's, they felt like she was doing the same stuff, making the same types of movies. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If y'all watch it, you can see that hand gesture and eye roll. The pretty just <laughs> being kind of uh, typecast. Nasty. Um, she rebounds a bit, even though critics don't love it. Uh, Miss Congeniality comes out in 2000 and makes a ton of money. Uh, I think out of all of her comedies, Miss Congeniality is probably 
my favorite, even though she's been in some funny I stuff. I mean, that movie... I mean, that movie went on to also be a cult classic. I mean, 100%. I know they went on to make a few more miscongenialities, but um, that movie is like one of the most quoted movies in my friend group by far. I mean, we quote it all the time. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's such a good concept. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, you guys have to admit that that movie is oh, it's great. like, oh, I, it's, great. I, I it's so good. Every, I, I at least watch it once a year it's hilarious from like start to good movie Mm -hmm. and not just like and not just like the whole cast is really funny like she plays off well against like all those other people that are in it um and she's really good at like just slapstick and being goofy i that like i mean that a lot of people can't pull that off and i think that she yeah does that well and like so that film's credit it came out around the holiday season of 2002 it didn't open well like not extremely well but it legged it out to like over 100 million dollars because a lot of people continue to go see it uh, thought it was good again critics were hard on it they didn't give it really good reviews um and they also but she got nominated for a golden globe for best actress in the musical comedy for that too yeah um okay after this she still kind of is in the slump she does a movie called murder by numbers in 2002 um i saw it when it first came out i just know that ryan Gosling is in it and michael pitt uh they are two high school uh people or students who are wanting to be serial killers and she plays a detective it's a very very serious role for her but almost yeah. like too like there's not a lot of emotion in it she's very like kind of like stern and like you know there's not a lot of range in it playing um, by the book detective yeah, the, the movie itself is i remember being okay i just haven't seen it since it uh yeah. came out i do want to also note as we're going through her filmography um she does start like in the later years to be a producer on a lot of these bigger yeah. movies. She was a producer on Miss Congeniality yep. and she was also a producer on that uh, Murders by Numbers wow. and and Hope Hope Floats, she was a producer as well. So she's she was really trying to get in there as, um, you know, being more than just an actress in these movies. Right. And really she had, uh, it. Yeah, she had a pretty big year in 2002. She did one, two, three, uh, Murder by Numbers, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, which for some reason I've seen so many times, I don't know why. <laughs> That's such a I random like movie to see a lot. It's like, oh, it's, it's I don't know why I've seen it so many times, but it's not bad. Like, she's not the star of it. Like, it's like, um, but she isn't, uh, you should see it if you haven't seen it. It's like, I think it holds up pretty well. And like, uh, the older cast is actually really good. Like, Maggie Smith is in it and Ellen Burstyn. It's just a really, I think it's a really funny movie. Uh, and then she also did two weeks notice at the end of that year with uh, Hugh Grant. Um, oh, Hugh Grant. The thing is, like, the thing about all <laughs> Heart throb. Hugh Grant, because <laughs> he's always charmingly befuddled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was known in that time too, as like he had good chemistry with every woman. He was an opposite of movie with, I mean, he was really good with those rom coms. So, yeah, he made that's, I mean, he made a boatload of money from that. Yeah. And the thing mm-hmm. that, um, well, Murder by Numbers did okay at the box office. Divine Secrets did well. Two Weeks Notice did well. But she's still getting the same kind of critical response. So, like, it's either... it's the Yeah, same, people are hard on her. Not really stretching yeah. as much. Um, which is why her next film, two years later, is 2004. It's Crash. She is not in Crash a lot. But what she does in Crash, I think, is pretty amazing. And that actually, like, turned the tide on a lot of critics who were saying that she's kind of one note and she only can ride on her likability. Mm-hmm. A lot of those same critics started to give her positive notices because of her work in Crash. Saying even if it was just a small role, she still played it well. Yeah, I mean, she has like that one, she has a big moment in the movie where she wants the locks changed on the on the door the next day because a, a Spanish guy is doing the locks. And this is after her and her husband that got carjacked at the beginning of the movie. And she has this big blow up like monologue that everyone was like, she, she was fucking great. Like she she really hadn't done anything up to that point like that and a lot of people gave her credit because it, it was a smaller role and she did it because she liked the project and didn't care how big the how part big, was yeah but just loved being a part of the ensemble and i uh but she did get a lot of notices for it because uh maybe the critics are hard on her because they knew that she had more of a potential for like be more than just these rom-com mm-hmm. movies maybe they were mm-hmm. like she could do, she can do so much more she, her range is huge and they were trying to push her to do that they kept casting her in the type of role so she didn't really have hopeful well i mean it could be possible that they 
I mean, she wasn't getting the offers to do anything like that. So it was mostly, she wasn't necessarily doing it out of her own fruition. It was just the thing that she was being offered work for. And so she had to kind of be typecast at that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the next movies, uh, she, well, after winning them over with Crash, she does uh, Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Fabulous, which they really didn't like. And a lot of people didn't like it. It didn't really do that well compared to the first one. Um, it is like just a rehash of the first movie and not as good. Um, but yeah, she does that. She does the lake house with Green Knight with Keanu Reeves. Um, movie does okay, but it's kind of forgettable. Mm-hmm. Uh, she does Premonition, which is it has like, a good soundtrack. Does have a good soundtrack. I do remember that. <laughs> uh, she does Premonition, which is like a thriller horror horror film. Makes money, but critics don't like it. Um, but then she had a really great 2009, and it was because she actually accepted two roles that Julia Roberts was offered, but she turned down. Uh, the first one was The Proposal. We talked about a little bit with Ryan Reynolds. Julia Roberts was offered that. She turned it down. Uh, Sandra Bullock stepped in. It came, uh, I think it's like the her biggest opening weekend uh, at the box office is for The Proposal. Mm-hmm. And, it, uh, and it made uh, a lot of money. Uh, and then that one was super well received, yeah. And kind of like she got her like kind of box office clout back and in a big way. And then also that year, she does uh, The Blind Side, and yep. that movie makes a ton of money. And she wins an Academy Award yeah. for it, um, yeah. finally giving her the respect that she probably was like, Yeah, I can do this. Um, she really isn't, too, even if you thought that maybe she didn't deserve it for The Blind Side. Um, I always thought when watching Gravity, which she was also nominated for, but she didn't win, I thought Gravity proved that she earned that Oscar. Like she is a very talented actress. She has to, she has to uh, handle Gravity like all on her own. I mean, I know George mm-hmm. did, but like it's mostly her. It's and pretty much all her. That's all of her. Um, and I, I, I think that second Oscar nomination, even though she didn't win, I think it kind of justified the Oscar win that she got for mm-hmm. the Black Side. Because even I was like, oh, there's other people maybe, like, that was the year that Gabrae Sidibe was now ready for Precious. There were people that maybe were stronger than her, but I thought she kind of was like, she deserved her due, and it was great. That's why I was yeah. like, this year win. She is really damn good in that movie. Uh, <laughs> but what she did that was really funny. She also was in the movie that year called All About Steve, and then she... Uh, the night before she won her Oscar, she won the Razzie for Worst Actress for All About Steve, and she accepted it in person. Nice. She's uh, a good sport. She's a good sport about it. And then, you know, from there, you know, she did Ocean's 8 in 2018. She's kind of taking a little bit of a break because I know she was uh, she's raising her kids uh, and stuff like that. She did Ocean's 8 in 2018 and then Bird Box. Uh, and then she has The Unforgettable coming out this Friday. And then The Lost City with Channing Tatum next year which is like a kind of return to romantic comedies for her uh she plays like a romance novelist who it goes on a trip with her the model that is or that inspires like all her covers and they get caught up in this like jungle romance of- yeah it sounds ridiculous but i'm sure they'll make it funny um but yeah, yeah i do want to make a note though because because you said that she took a break because she was raising your kids and I, I think there was more to it. I think she took a break because of there was she went through a home invasion. Oh yeah, that's, which uh, felt very yeah. I think that took a lot sick. out of her, and um, I know she's been part of the group of celebrity moms that are kind of getting together. I guess celebrity parents uh, that are getting together to fight against paparazzi photographing children. Their children. So I know she's been part of that movement. So. I don't think she took a break necessarily to raise her kids. I think she took a break to focus on other things Mm -hmm. um, that were more important to her at the time. I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think so too. Also, I want to point out too that uh, in 2010 and 2014, she was the highest paid actress of both those years in the industry. Uh, There was a point where she was commanding $20 million a movie. Uh, Let's go. Her, Julia Roberts were in that league. Cameron Diaz was in that league. Uh, for a little bit um it's so weird that that league is not that huge for women but there were, i mean but it was a big deal that she was making that much i mean movie. being a being a producer on those movies too really helps oh, yeah she was killing it but yeah i'm kind of um i love her i'm already, I'm already going to tell you that i'm giving her my stamp of approval because even the stuff that she's not her movies that aren't that great 
I still think that she's pretty solid in the stuff that she like. I like she's good in Speed too. It's not a good movie, but mm-hmm. she, she gives one hundred percent of herself, even when she knows like the project may not be up to stuff. And I, yeah. I think it, being likable goes a long way. But I also think that she has proven that she's pretty immensely talented in both comedy and drama. I like her. Yeah, I think it's crazy that we that not we, but I guess the critics are making being likable a bad thing because I think that's a really good thing and it'll get you really far in this industry. So, I mean, I I would much rather be likable than like get the rep that like Will Ferrell has where like he's a diva on set, you know? Like Mm. I'd rather be likable. Yeah, you totally. want to be like Edward Norton or Will Ferrell. Like you want to be like, hey, you I like working like too likable. That sounds like <laughs> yeah. kind of oh darn. Like that's, what? That's not yeah. Yeah, it's just so weird to have like yeah. turn on you that way. Like, oh, like we loved you for this when you did speed, but can you do something else now? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> I just liked her too much in that movie. Yeah. What <laughs> does that mean? Yeah. No, she definitely gets she definitely gets my stamp of approval. I think that not every i mean i i don't know a single actor or actress who's made every single one of their movies be a per- perfect critic hit and perfect box office hit so there's no way that she can get dinged or, or knocked for making some that weren't as well received the the stuff that she made i i will if she's on on the tv if i'm scrolling through something or flipping through channels and she's on i'm definitely going to sit and watch um I, I very much enjoy her acting. I think that she can play a lot of different roles. Plus, she's stunningly gorgeous, so it's always good to see her. Um, and I think she's funny, um, makes a lot of good stuff. I, I think maybe in the, the times now where she's choosing her projects more carefully, that's yeah. going to be even better, and she's going to make even better stuff. So she gets my stamp of uh, and back to the blockbuster approved. Nice. I'm glad she I does. agree. I, I was gonna. She's got gonna, my stamp. I was gonna throw chairs if one of you guys said no. <laughs> no, she's no, definitely I approved. Think, I think we it's have... good that we um. Agree. I think it's good that we're ending on a good note where we all agree on Sandra yeah. can stay. Yeah, yeah Sandra, you are, you've also, officially been approved. I love that she's a great interview too. Like watching her interviews while she's been promoting this very serious movie. Like she's also very just funny. Like yeah. been doing interviews and stuff. Like. She talked about how like she, her and Shane Tatum become really good friends, and he, they were like, "Oh, like, are you gonna be a Magic Mike three? As he asked you, and she was just like, "Oh, like, I don't want to upstage him because you know, <laughs> they, they look at me, they're gonna be all about this. They're gonna be all about." Yeah, <laughs> and she's like, she's like a good person. But yeah, she's just a funny, likable person, and like you know, and she's been one of those people. I think even though critics have been hard on her, I think the general movie going public has always really liked her. Yep. And that's why she can sell movies and have rooted for it. That's why she, you know, I would argue that she was one of the like a dying breed of like when you can be a real movie star where your name could sell a movie that doesn't really happen a lot anymore. Um, mm-hmm. but she was definitely one of those name above the title people that could sell a movie based on her name. Oh, yeah, so yeah, mm-hmm. she gets my approval. Well done, Sandra. She says no, <laughs> well done. She has a seat at the table always, always, always. Oh, yeah. And Sandra, if you're listening, we'd, we'd love to have you on the podcast <laughs> and you can talk about um, your favorite movie you've been in. Yeah, if you're not busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, if you could just squeeze Whenever you get a chance. 45 yeah. minutes. Like, we'll work around your schedule, don't worry. Yeah, I know, you got a lot going on, yeah. but we would really appreciate if you could uh, talk about your filmography <laughs> with us, uh, <laughs> with us movie nerds. Um, but yeah, that was fun. I like doing this. I actually agree that we should reach out to people and see what they want us to pick. And I, I really yeah. want to get one that we disagree on, though. That will be probably more fun. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure one will come up. I'm sure one will come up. Yeah. Let's uh, do one on Jared Leto. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> oh yeah, I would totally do that. Actually, that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm gonna let. Um, Actually, before I let Owen sign us off, I wanted to just let everyone know that we are doing a bonus episode for the 25th anniversary of Stream. That will be something we're recording next. Um, We have a couple of guests on to kind of help us talk about uh, the history of that movie and its impact today. And uh, it's just going to be dedicated to Scream. So no news, just all about what's your favorite scary movie. And that's Mm -hmm. it. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, um, well, as always, we are a playlist original. Um, 
very uh, excited to continue to do this. I, I love talking to you guys every single Monday. It's something I always look forward to. Um, you can find us anywhere on anywhere you get your podcasts, so Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, our YouTube channel. We put out our episodes like we like to say, if you want to see us laughing and, and uh, see our smiling faces or in some cases, Brittany's um, uh, dog or anything like that, then you're more than welcome to check us out on YouTube. So please uh, just thank you for everyone who likes to listen and uh, we will be back next week. Thank you. As always, beautiful job, Owen. Thanks, guys. Later.